Long, and here we are once again with Grafted In, a broadcast where we talk about the Jewish roots of the Christian faith, as well as looking at the events of the Middle East, uh, particularly surrounding Israel and what's going on in uh, Eretz Israel, the land of Israel. What are the end time things that are happening? What are the signs of the world that, that should alert us to, uh, to be a little more uh, cautious, a little more uh, vigilant about what's going on in our own nation? Uh, in last week's broadcast, I talked a lot about uh, the background of the uh, uh, so-called West Bank, Sh Shamron, uh, Judea and Samaria. Uh, I don't want to get, get on that again because I took a, a lot of last week's broadcast about that. But I ended the broadcast talking about the fact that uh, of the rabbi and his children that were killed last week uh, on a road that goes from Itamar to Alone Marais. I described what goes on in Itamar and Alone Marais. I would encourage you to uh, get in the archives and look up last week's broadcast for that. Uh, Rabbi Edom and Naama Henkin were murdered by terrorists, Palestinian terrorists. Uh, the terrorists would have killed their four children in the back of the car, but fortunately they didn't know the four children were there. Uh, and they ran away and the children therefore were saved. Uh, all four terrorists, by the way, have been uh, captured, uh, have confessed to the crime, uh, typical of what goes on in the Middle East, uh, the Palestinians celebrate. You know, Jews mourn, even, even, even if, uh, if an Arab child or something is, is killed, uh, the Jews will mourn for it, but, you know, Palestinians rejoice. They hand out candies when, when people are murdered. Wake up, world, because this is, you're looking at two worlds. There is good, there is evil. I always liked what President Reagan said uh, when he talked about the evil empire, and people kept getting after him. Well, you can't talk about good and evil. Well, you better. And the Bible says that one of the signs of the end times is that people are going to call good evil, and they're going to call evil good. And, and that is the world you and I are in now. And if those of us who, who understand morality, understand democracy, understand truth, if we remain silent, then evil is going to triumph. Uh, all that evil needs is for uh, good and truth to remain silent. And, and so on this broadcast, we don't do that. We are going to speak the truth. We're going to share truth about what's, what's going on in the, the Middle East. Uh, there is an increasing agitation uh, to, uh, to kill Jews. Uh, Anti-Semitism is rife. There's riots going on now and then at Temple Mount. And uh, I, I think that's, uh, that's just so amazing because Temple Mount is, is under the control of the Iman. Uh, unfortunately, General Moshe Dayan in 1967, when Israel recaptured uh, Jerusalem, he said, we're going to give operational control of Temple Mount to the Iman. So the, the land technically is Israel's, but the control of activities is by the Iman. And they have riots up there regularly, and they throw stones down at times uh, on the Jewish worshipers below. That's intolerance in anybody's book. And yet again, the press doesn't address it. The press never says, gee, you know, these uh, Arab radical, radical uh, Palestinian uh, youth terrorists are once again throwing rocks at the innocent Jews. No, they say, what did the Jews do to provoke it? You know, it's... And the, the provocation seems to be that they're Jewish, I guess. But, you know, there are Palestinians that are speaking out. And, and I want to share with you today an article. I'm going to read most of it. It's pretty short. Uh, by Bassam Tawil. And he is a Palestinian. But he's a scholar uh, based in Jerusalem. And he's one who's willing to speak out and uh, uh, take on the Palestinian issue head on. I'm, I'm always amazed that uh, of the courage of Palestinians who are willing to stand up for the truth and speak it because they do so at the risk of their life, or for, for example, uh, Arab Christians in Israel who, for example, serve in the IDF. You know, it's like there's this, Arabs are not supposed to help Israel. Excuse me, you're a citizen of the nation. Arabs are exempt from compulsory military duty. Well, why? Because you don't want Arabs shooting your own troops. So. But among Christian Arabs, young people, there's a move now. Israel is their land. Israel is their home. And yes, they're Arabs. They happen to be Christian Arabs, but they're Arabs. But they live in Israel, and they're Israeli citizens, and 
a number of those young people are signing up for the IDF, uh, many times uh, risking great uh, 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 separation and ridicule among their peers uh, in their communities, but they're doing so. Bassam uh, Tawil, that's T-A-W-I-L, has a lot of his articles are published on uh, Gatestone Institute. I, I encourage you to look him up. He writes on a, a variety of issues that I think are great. But listen to the title of this one, and it will give you a hint of what he's after. Palestinians, why our leaders are hypocrites and liars. Wow. Could, we could maybe say that same kind of thing in, in the United States, but he's saying to the Palestinians, why our leaders are hypocrites and liars. And this is what he says. We contaminate our mosques with our own hands and feet and then blame Jews for dis desecrating Islamic holy sites. If anyone is desecrating Islamic holy sites, it is those who bring explosives, uh, weapons, and firebombs into al Aska Mosque. The Jews who visit the Temple Mount do not bring with them stones, bombs, or clubs. It is young Muslim men who are desecrating our holy sites with their filthy feet. Now, what is he talking about? That's a constant cry. Jews are desecrating. Jews are desecrating. You know, we've been up on Temple Mount. We don't always go there. Uh, there's certain hours only when, when non-Muslims can, can go on Temple Mount. And by the way, you're not allowed to pray there. Jews are not allowed to pray. So you think you're in this very holy site. But you go up there and you see the children playing soccer in the, in the, in the mall there. They're kicking balls around. You see people having picnic. Doesn't, doesn't look like a very holy site. And what he's pointing out is, and in the al Aska Mosque, uh, they bring firebombs in. They bring weapons in. Who is desecrating the holy sites? Let's keep reading. These leaders, including Abbas himself, are not willing to send their own children and grandchildren to participate in the, quote, popular struggle. They are fully responsible for sending the children of others to throw stones and firebombs at Jews. Sitting in their luxurious offices and villas in Ramallah, they demand that Israel be held responsible for cracking down on innocent Palestinians. Their main goal is to embarrass Israel and depict it as a state that takes tough measures against Palestinian teenagers. Now, as an aside, when he talks about them sitting in their luxurious offices and villas in Ramallah, I was commenting to some of the students from our homeschool group who were here that um, uh, Mr. Abbas is in the process of building a multi-million dollar palace in Ramallah. Mm. He's a little more bold than Arafat. Uh, Arafat, when he lived in Ramallah, lived in humble things. He was pictured as the Shea Guevara. He was the radical guerrilla fighting for freedom, and he wore his army fatigues and lived in this poor section. Well, the, the truth was, Arafat squandered hundreds of millions of dollars, and a lot of that money was in Paris, where his wife lived in an expensive multi-million dollar suite at the top of one of the apartment buildings, and he had hundreds of million dollars in the bank. He just didn't decide to display it. Abbas is even bolder. Why? Because the West has never held Abbas accountable. And so while there's a lack of hospitals, there's a lack of schooling, there's a lack of infrastructure among the Palestinian people, uh, the, the fact is hundreds of millions of dollars is being spent for the uh, luxurious offices that our writer talks about. Let me continue. He said, these youths are not taking to the streets to to fight occupation. Their main goal is to kill or cause grievous bodily harm to Jews. When someone tosses a firebomb at a house or a car, his intention is to burn civilians alive. It is as if our leaders, notice he's a Palestinian saying this, it is as if our leaders are saying that throwing stones and firebombs at, at Jews in their cars and homes is a basic right of Palestinians. Our leaders believe Israel has no right to defend itself against those who seek to burn Jews dri driving in their vehicles or sleeping inside their homes. While Hamas and Islamic Jihad 
are continuing to exploit our teenagers in the Gaza Strip by training them to join the jihad against Jews and infidels, our leaders in the West Bank are committing a similar crime against Palestinian youth. The Palestinian leadership, headed by Mahmoud Abbas, who falsely describes himself as president of the state of Palestine, there is no state of Palestine, has been encouraging our teenagers to engage in the so-called popular resistance against Israel. But these leaders, including Abbas himself, are not willing to send their own children into that struggle. As usual, our leaders want the children of others to take to the streets and throw the firebombs. The popular struggle that the PA leadership is spearheading these days is anything but peaceful. In some instances, it has even proved to be lethal. Recently, Alexander Levovich was killed after losing control of his vehicle in Jerusalem. Investigations showed that at least four Arab youths had pelted his car with stones, causing him to hit a tree. During the past few months, hundreds of Palestinian teenagers from Jerusalem have been arrested for throwing stones and firebombs at Israeli vehicles. These teenagers have offered various explanations as to why they decided to take part in the popular resistance against Israel. Most of them said they wanted to protest against visits by Jews to the Temple Mount, an act described by our leaders as contamination of Islamic holy sites. Abbas, who is by no means a devout Muslim, recently accused Jews of des desecrating the al Aska Mosque with their filthy feet. Let me go to an aside here. The truth of the matter is that when Arabs control a city, other religions are destroyed. When Jews control a city, they respect the right of all religions. So when the Jordanians had control of half of Jerusalem, they destroyed every single synagogue in that side of Jerusalem was leveled. Can you imagine the outcry if the Jews in 1967 took over Jerusalem and said, okay, every mosque we're going to tear down to the ground. What if they went to the al Aska Mosque and took it down, the Temple Dome, took it down, said, we're going to build our temple there. There would have been riots around the world. And yet, Islam does that regularly. Right now, ISIS, as it takes over cities, destroys Christian churches, destroys any historical archaeological things that are not Islamic, destroys them. And the world says nothing. The truth is, if you want freedom in Jerusalem, you don't want a divided Jerusalem, you want the Jews in charge of it. If you want freedom in Israel for Jews and Christians and Muslims and Baha'i and any other religious group to worship, then you want the Jews in charge of Israel. If you want freedom in America of worship, then we must have people who value freedom. Muslims in charge of a city in America will do everything to prevent uh, freedom from happening. Let me just give you an aside because people will say, that's not really happening in an America, is it? Well, just last week there was a post that came on YouTube that, and Facebook that really got uh, things going for a lot of people. Uh, a mother, happened to be a Christian, just reviewed her seventh grader's history assignment. In the assignment, he had a worksheet that he was to fill out in which he was to identify the key beliefs of, of Islam. Uh, what are the key historical events of Islam? And in the worksheet, there was also one of those little things you can scan with your cell phone or your iPod, and it's going to take you to a site where you can hear Islamic prayers being prayed. She simply said, what is this? I don't want my son to participate in this. That same school, by the way, won't allow you to mention Jesus. That same school, by the way, will not allow you to teach Christianity. That same school, by the way, would be up in arms if another history teacher passed out a paper and said, your homework assignment, what are the basic doctrinal beliefs of Catholicism? Uh, tell me the key points in the Bible. Uh, tune on to this and you will hear a Baptist pastor praying. You see, there's, there's a one-sidedness to it. And if, if a Christian tried to do that, there'd be all kinds of, no, separation of church and state, 
but our schools are being indoctrinated with an Islamic influence, uh, most of it being driven by CAIR, which is a Muslim Brotherhood front organization to get Islam into the education system of America under the guise of, of tolerance. No, wait a minute. If you can't have Christianity in there, why is it that you have Islam? Last year, a, a high school class in Texas was taken for a field trip to visit an imam, to visit a mosque. And there he told them all about Islam, and they sat in while he taught them about Islam and invited them to say some Islamic prayers with him. Imagine if that same school said, and next week we're going to go to a synagogue, and the rabbi's going to teach you about Judaism, and we're going to learn a little bit of Hebrew. And then the week after that, we're going to the First Baptist Church, and the pastor there is going to tell you about evangelical Christianity and lead you in some, some prayers. You see, you know, and I know, there would have been outcry about the synagogue, an outcry about the, uh, the church, but nobody dared say anything about Islam. Hmm. Something's going on we need to be aware of. And so uh, the writer of this article is saying, you know, there's a hypocrisy going on. Abbas and other senior figures in the Palestinian Authority leadership have also been issuing daily threats against Israel in response to perfectly peaceful visits by Jews to the Temple Mount. This is a Palestinian saying, I'm a Palestinian, but guess what? The Jews want to come up, they just want to pray, they're perfectly peaceful, and yet the Palestinian leadership is stirring up riots, and then the world gets in and says, there's riots going on in Temple Mount because of the Jews. No, it's because of the Palestinian Authority. Glory to God. Our leaders, he continues to write, who are fully responsible for sending these teenagers to throw stones and firebombs at Jews, uh, as I said earlier, are sitting in their offices in Ramallah. After having incited our youth to engage in violence against Jews, our hypocritical leaders are now rushing to condemn new Israeli measures against stone throwers. It's as if our leaders are saying that throwing stones and firebombs at Jews in cars and homes is a basic right of Palestinians. You know, come with us to Israel, and one of the things that we do is we, we take you along parts where there is a fence between uh, Israel proper and, and the West Bank. And boy, the world has made all kinds of deals about, oh, this is apartheid, this is, you know, you don't even know what you're talking about. When you say Israeli is a, apartheid, forgive for me saying so, you're just totally ignorant of what apartheid is. Uh, you're just parodying things, and it's going on in our college campuses, and it's, it's just, you know, apartheid, you have no rights. <laughs> in Israel, all the Arabs have rights. That, that settles the argument right there. But anyway, there's a fence. And, and yeah, there is a fence. Uh, the press likes to show it as a wall. If you get into Jerusalem, it is. It's a cement wall. But when you travel through most of Israel, it's a, it's a fence, security fence. Uh, there's a, a road plowed on each side of it, so every day the IDF goes by, we can see footprints to see if anybody's uh, tried to get across. Uh, the fence is electronically monitored. Uh, we've been at the fence up in, um, up in the north border, on the border with Lebanon, a uh, story in and of itself. On, on the Israeli side, they're growing kiwi plants. On the Lebanese side, they're growing marijuana. Um, but this, this fence is there. And the world says that's terrible and everything. Well, number one... The fence dramatically decreased the assault on Israeli citizens. The terrorist, effective terrorist blowing up of, of buses and blowing up restaurants ceased once that fence went up. Because now to get into Israel, you've got to go through a checkpoint. Uh, by the way, there's a lot of talk about a fence between us and Mexico. And I agree there should be one. In fact, a lot of Mexico, especially near the California side, there is a fence there. But some think about it. Nobody's criticizing our fence. No one's saying big bad Americans are building this fence uh, to keep Mexicans out. Yeah, we have a process by which you can come into our country. There is a border, and you go through the border, and you can apply for a visa, and you, there is a way to get in. We're not saying you can't come in. We're saying you can't come in illegally. But think about this. We're building a fence to keep people out because of what they're going to cost our economy, not because they're murdering Americans. The the state of Israel built a fence to keep murderers out. 
And yet the world condemns the fence to keep the murderers out and says nothing about the fence to keep the uh, unwanted immigrants out. By the way, there's a fence between Pakistan and Israel. By the way, there's a fence between North and South Korea. By the way, there, there's a, a fence still in portions of, of Ireland. Come on. You know, by the way, I can take you down to Boca Raton and Florida, nice communities down there, lots of money, and, and, and there's fences around those. Oh, except we don't call them fences, we call them gated communities. What do we mean by a gated community? Well, they're all multi-million dollar homes inside, we build a big wall, we put a, a barrier on top of it so people can't get in, and we have a checkpoint to which if you want to go in there, you got to tell them who are you going to visit. If you say, I just want to go drive around, no, it's a gated community. And, and you say, well, I'm, I'm here to, to have dinner with somebody. They'll pick up the phone and call them. Are these people, are you expecting these people? They're gated communities. We think that's perfectly okay. You need to protect yourself from, from the bad guys who might come into your community and rob your homes. Then why can't Israel have a fence? Why can't Israel have a law that says, we're going to arrest you if you throw rocks at cars? I mean, I would sure hope that in Fitchburg, our police would arrest a gang if we found out regularly for fun they were just throwing rocks at cars and causing accidents. And yet Abbas says, these bad Israelis are doing that. So, let's, uh, let's continue with uh, Bassam's last paragraph here. He says, it is obvious that our leaders are once again leading us toward a catastrophe. They want our children to get hurt or killed so that they can go to the United Nations and complain that Israel is using excessive force against the Palestinians. Our leaders, of course, do not tell the world that they are the ones inciting these young men to take to the streets and attack the Jews they run into. Nor do they tell the world that it is, it is Muslims not Jews, who are contaminating Islamic holy sites through their violent acts. Well, bravo, Mr. Tawil, and may God put his angels around you to protect you from the repercussion of those who would like to silence your voice. So what's going on in the Middle East? It is a conflict of civilizations. It is a conflict of worldviews. It is a conflict of value systems. I have a good friend in Israel who was part of the IDF for years. He still serves his uh, annual duty, Ronnie Levy. Ronnie uh, runs a tour company, uh, and, and among other things that he does. And a lot of times we use Ronnie's uh, uh, tour agency with us. Uh, but Ronnie made this comment to me. He said that, you know, if, if the Jews, if the Arabs were to lay down their weapons tomorrow, if there was a treaty and all Palestinians agreed, we're going to lay down our weapons tomorrow. He said there will be peace in the Middle East. If the Jews said, however, we're going to lay down our arms no matter what you do, he said tomorrow there would be the obliteration of Israel. And see, that's the clash of two worldviews. He described a scene to me one time where he was on duty and he was standing on a, on a hillside overlooking a valley, and there were some Arab farmers down there. And Ronnie said, I'm standing there, and I, and I have my Uzi, and I'm obviously a military soldier, and I'm looking down just right below me, and here these Arabs are working in their fields. And he says, they know I'm there. But I noticed that they paid no attention to me. They didn't look at me, they didn't try to hide, they didn't post a scout to keep his eye on me. Because they knew I would never shoot them. They knew that I'm standing there with an Uzi, but I am not going to simply all of a sudden decide to start shooting Arab farmers. And it struck me that if there was another valley and there were seven, eight, nine, ten Jewish farmers uh, working in their field, and all of a sudden a Palestinian showed up with a rifle. They're all going to be nervous. They're all going to be watching him. They're going to appoint one who, to stop working, and you keep your eye on that. And if he picks up his rifle and points it at us, you know, yell a warning to us. Because they know that if a Palestinian shows up with a gun, he more than likely is going to shoot you. 
even a Palestinian policeman. The PA has their own police authority, but many times they, they have been uh, found guilty of themselves killing Jews. That is a clash of world views. When ISIS took uh, 20 or 30 Coptic Christian men, took them to the edge of the ocean, had them kneel down and beheaded every one of them, that is a clash of world views. You see, if Christians took over uh, a Muslim nation right now, they're not going to start killing Muslims. But Islam will kill the infidel. You say, Pastor, that's not politically correct to say. It is the truth. And we need to wake up that what's going on in the world, and it, and it comes in the Middle East, is a clash of worldviews. And so to that young Jewish girl who asked me one day when I was in Israel, why, why does the world hate us so much? My answer to her was that it is supernatural. It makes no sense. It makes no sense why the world would be so anti-Israel and anti-Jewish. It makes no sense. They're, just a, they're not even 1% of the world's population. You know, uh, it, it makes no sense that, that people in the world want to kill the Jews when the vast majority of scientific advances in physics, chemistry, and medicine come out of Jews. Why would you want to kill the people who've been more uh, used in humanity to bring life saving? Why would you want to do that? It, it makes no sense that, that a uh, Palestinian woman would, who's pregnant and has been helped by a Jewish hospital would strap a bomb around herself to go back to that same hospital to blow up the doctors. I said, it, it, it makes no sense. There's nothing logical about it. Uh, Israel is not trying to take over lands in the world. Why are you not paranoid Arabs about each other? Of course they are. But, but it makes no sense, I said to this young lady. It is supernatural. The only explanation is there's a supernatural hostility to the Jews. And so I looked her in the eye and I said, and do you know why? And she said, no, I, I don't understand it. I said, because you are God's people. And there is a spiritual force in the world that hates the God of creation. And you are the embodiment of the God of creation. And since the beginning of time, that evil force has hated God's people. All we're seeing is it's taken on a modern, a modern look. And I said to her, what you need to do is stand up for who you are. This is Pastor Don Long. It's been good being with you today. Look forward to sharing with you next week on Grafted In.